introduce to today's speaker. Today's speaker is Dr. Sebastian Dell from EPFL Lausanne. Uh, he received a PhD from Max Planck Institute at 2019. And after that, he moved to the EP EPFL and is now working as a postdoc fellow. Uh, today, he's going to talk about a very interesting topic. The title is The Ambiguity of General Relativity, uh, Implication for Inflation and Dark Matter. So, Sebastian, uh, please start your presentation. Mm. Yeah, so th thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and, and to give this talk, and I'm very happy about your interest in this topic. Um, so, uh, yeah, my, my, my talk is going to have two parts. The first about the ambiguities of general relativity and the second one about implications for inflation and dark matter. And uh, this is based on work with uh, Georgos Karananas, uh, Claire Rigutso, Misha Shaposhikov, Andrei Sterlin, and Ina Timiryasov. So in particular, four papers that I'm showing at the bottom of the slide. Um, so let me start with a brief historical motivation. So uh, as we all know, uh, the, the great achievement of Einstein uh, was to describe gravity in terms of geometry, um, namely in the original theory that he proposed in 1915, uh, he described gravity in terms of curvature. Um, so I'm showing here a, a sketch of, uh, of, of, uh, of the effect of curvature. So if you parallel transport a vector along an infinitesimal curve, then the vector will change. And then that is uh, due to curvature. Um, and here curvature uh, is determined by the Riemann tensor um, that I'm uh, writing down. Um, so that, that's what we all know. Um, what is very interesting is that uh, very soon after, two other concepts were proposed. Um, so three years later, in 1918, uh, Hermann Weil uh, proposed that um, the length of a vector may change along parallel transport. So that uh, um, so, so that uh, yeah, that, that, correspond, that that can be called non-metricity. Um, and and so so Weil, uh, in his original paper, said that um, well, so the, the 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 curvature is a uh, is a non-integrability of, of the direction. So, uh, so the direction of the vector depends on the path that it is taken. And so for him, it was very natural to say that also the length of the vector should depend on the path that the vector has taken. Um, and then uh, mathematically, um, the non-metricity corresponds to the non-vanishing of the covariant derivative of the metric. Um, so that was, was in 1918, uh, the proposal by Weil to include non-metricity. And then in 1922, Emile Cartan um, proposed the non-closure of infinitesimal parallelograms. So if you have two vectors and parallel transport them along each other, um, then uh, the torsion causes a non-closure of this infinitesimal diagram. Um, and mathematically, that corresponds to an anti-symmetric part in the in the Christoffel symbols in the lower indices. And now, historically, um, these these concepts were mainly used for attempts to unify gravity and electromagnetism. So, and then also Einstein took up both both non-metricity and uh, torsion for his famous attempts, uh, fam famously unsuccessful attempts of unifying uh, gravity and electromagnetism. Um, and then the interest was was kind of lost in in, in, in non-metricity and torsion. Um, but still the question remains, um, which of these geometric concepts should you include? So, so given a differentiable manifold, should you include curvature and or torsion and or non-metricity? Um, and then the different possible choices correspond to different formulations of general relativity. So the, the, what I will call the metric formulation, the original proposal by Einstein is to only include curvature. Um, but as you can see, there are many other options, for example, including both curvature and torsion corresponds to the Einstein-Katan formulation. Um, and I will uh, explain this in more detail. Um, what is very interesting is that at first sight, these theories seem very different. So it's a very different geometry, whether or not the, the parallelogram closes or not, whether or not the, the length of the vector is conserved along parallel transport. 
Um, but it turns out in pure gravity. So as long as you don't include uh, any uh, any other fields uh, other than gravity, um, these formulations are all equivalent. So even though you start from very different geometric assumptions, you end up with exactly the same theory. Um, so so these uh, um, so in particular, it means the number of propagating degrees of freedom is the same. So all these theories only propagate the two polarizations of the massless graviton. Um, and uh, yeah, and so the, 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 uh, the, um, these formulations are not modifications of gravity. Of course, there are modifications of gravity, for example, adding a graviton mass. So that will already be different um, in the absence of matter. Um, but here, these different formulations corresponding to the different geometries um, are e equivalent in pure gravity. So they are just uh, different formulations of one and the same theory of gravity. Um, now, man, one might think that it doesn't matter which of these formulations uh, one uses, but this is not true. Because once you include other fields, once you include matter, um, the different formulations will lead to different observable predictions. Um, and so the, the, the formulations can be regarded as an inherent ambiguity of GR. So, so the, the pure gravity cannot distinguish between them. But once you include uh, the matter fields, once you couple gravity to the standard model, um, predictions will generically depend on the choice of formulation. Um, and so this is the motivation for, for my talk to explore rele relevance of the formulation. So, uh, uh, to, to see in which context does it matter, um, which formulation I take, and then what is, uh, so, so, and then to quantify the difference. Um, and so the, the talk uh, is, is, is going to go as follows. Um, first, I will use the einstein cartan formulation as an example to introduce um, why uh, the formulations are equivalent in pure gravity and how they are no longer equivalent once you include matter. Um, and then I will generalize einstein cartan uh, to metric affine gravity. In the second part, I will discuss implications for Higgs inflation. Um, so, uh, to, so, so Higgs inflation is, is one of the examples where the formulation matters the most, one could say. So they are really the, um, the, the, the outcome crucially depends on, on the assumptions about the, the geometry of gravity. And finally, I will give an outlook in particular by discussing implications for fermionic dark matter. And of course, um, please feel free to interrupt me at any point in the talk and, and to ask questions. So I'm, I'm happy to make this interactive. Um, okay, um, let me start with introducing the einstein cartan formulation. Um, so the setup is that we have two sets of independent fields, um, the metric G mu nu and the Christoffel symbol uh, gamma, uh, gamma alpha beta gamma. Um, and so this is uh, to, if you only have one fundamental field, so if you only have the metric as fundamental field, then uh, automatically you will exclude uh, torsion and non-metricity. So, so in this setup, we, we, we have two fundamental fields, so the so-called first order formalism. Um, allows to include or exclude uh, freely the geometric quantities. And now the einstein cartan formulation, as said before, is defined by including uh, curvature, so the, the Riemann tensor R, and uh, torsion, so torsion uh, defined as, as the anti-symmetric parts in the lower indices of the Christoffel symbol while at the same time assuming that non-metricity vanishes, so the, the covariant derivative of the uh, of the metric vanishes. Um, what is, uh, so as a side remark, what is very interesting about the einstein cartan formulation is that it can also be derived as a gauge theory of the Poincaré group. So this was discussed in the 50s and 60s. Um, so the, the, you write down some, some meta Lagrangian, you see that it is a global Poincaré invariance, and then by demanding that it is local, you can derive gravity as the gauge field of this local Poincaré invariance. And this is very interesting because it puts gravity on the same footing as the other fields of the standard model. So that also can be derived as, uh, as gauge theories. Um, and then to reiterate, um, of course, einstein cartan gravity does not uh, contain any uh, additional propagating degrees of freedom apart from the two polarizations of the massless graviton. Um, and of course, this is, is a consistency requirement. Otherwise, I cannot call it a formulation. So, so for a formulation should be equivalent in pure gravity. 
And so of course it, uh, it must have the same spectrum as metric GR. Um, okay, and then let's, let's go into equations. Um, so uh, as, as a method of analysis, it's very convenient to split the full Christoffel uh, symbol gamma into two parts. So the, the first part is the levi civita so the Christoffel symbol corresponding to the levi civita connection. So the levi civita connection is the unique connection uh, determined by the requirements of vanishing torsion and vanishing non-metricity. So the levi civita connection is a function of the metric and, and is, is the connection that, that you, you use in metric GR. And so, so we split the full Christoffel symbol into the, the levi civita contribution and the rest. And then the rest is only a function of torsion. Um, and then um, the first question we have to ask um, is what is the action of the theory? So if we want to define the, the einstein katan theory, then, then we, we need to write down an action. Um, and then the, the most natural uh, first thing that comes to mind would be just to write uh, in an analogy to the Einstein-Hilbert action, um, the, the full Ricci scalar, um, where this, this Ricci scalar now is derived from the, the, the full um, uh, from the full Christoffel symbol. Um, and I, will, I, I shall call in my talk this choice the Palatini action. Um, there's, there's great ambiguities in naming, um, so, so not everyone might call it this way. Um, but for now, for this talk, let me define an action that is only sensitive to the Ricci scalar, the, the Palatini scenario, and then we will see in a second um, what is the other option. Um, and now, um, once we plug in the full uh, Christoffel symbol into the Ricci scalar, um, we can split in uh, the Ricci scalar, so, so we can, can uh, use the split into torsion free part and torsion contribution, contributions to split the full Ricci scalar into a torsion free Ricci scalar. So in this talk, the, the over dot, so, so this, this symbol here uh, will always denote um, quantities derived from the levi civita connection, so torsion and non-metricity free uh, contributions. Um, and so we can split the full Ricci scalar into the uh, levi civita Ricci scalar plus contributions due to torsion. And these contributions uh, have two forms. So the one are quadratic uh, in uh, torsion and the others are derivatives. And so I'm not writing indices here. So um, this, this equation is meant as symbolic. Uh, so, so by t squared, I mean a quadratic, a quadratic Lorentz invariant uh, composed out of torsion. And of course, there are several of these Lorentz invariants. And so in reality, this is a sum of several torsion square terms. Um, uh, for now, I will just use the symbolic notation. Um, also, I put the derivative of torsion in gray because it's a total derivative. And so um, we, we can drop it. Um, and now in, in this, this Palatini action, where you start with the, the full Ricci scalar, um, you get these quadratic uh, torsion contributions, but with a specific coefficient. So uh, you, yeah, you, you can just plug that in and they're, they're, these are specific order one numbers. Um, and now uh, what it is very natural to generalize this action um, to arbitrary coefficients of the torsion uh, contributions. So instead of some fixed coefficient here, I take an arbitrary coefficient. Um, and of course, these are several coefficients because there are several torsion squared uh, terms. Um, now, what is the motivation for doing that? Um, so the, the, the idea is to uh, uh, avoid assumptions. So, so not to, so, so putting a specific coefficient for the torsion squared term is, is an assumption. And then it's, it's not clear why this coefficient should be like this. And so by making the coefficient arbitrary, we avoid assumptions. Um, but at the same time, we keep the equivalence to metric GR. So, so this point we will see in a second. Um, but uh, here the, the idea is to uh, write uh, a theory that is as general as possible while at the same time keeping the equivalence uh, to metric GR and pure gravity. Um, and so we also formalized, uh, so we formalized this, this procedure. So we, we devised criteria for constructing such actions that, that uh, like are as general as possible while still being equivalent to metric GR and pure gravity. So if you want, I can 
also tell you more about the the philosophy or the criteria for constructing constructing such an action um for now it's it's very intuitive to think of just write down the full Ritchie scalar, see what kind of contributions you get, and then make the coefficients arbitrary. Um, and then uh, now we can, uh, so, so we, we said we are in a first order formalism, so the connection and the metric are independent fundamental fields. And so I can vary the action with respect to the connection. And th that is equivalent to varying the action with respect to torsion. And then um, you immediately see what happens in this theory. So if I vary the action with respect to torsion, um, this torsion square term will give a linear contribution. So I will give, get something like torsion equals zero because there's only the, the quadratic contribution. And so we see that um, with this choice of action, so even more general one, um, so, so even the, yeah, the more general action here, um, will we'll give equations of motion um, that determine uh, vanishing torsion. And so this is how the equivalence in pure gravity comes about. So a priori, you don't assume anything about torsion, you include it in your action, but then you evaluate the equations of motion and you see that uh, torsion vanishes dynamically. So um, it's uh, so in metric GR, you assume from the beginning that torsion vanishes. In contrast, in einstein katan uh, you don't assume anything about torsion, but just uh, determine it by its equations of motion. Um, but both arrive at the same result of vanishing torsion. And that's how the, the einstein katan formulation is equivalent to the metric formulation. Um, and then, of course, it may be regarded as more aesthetical to um, derive the vanishing of torsion dynamically instead of an assumption. But um, yeah, physically, it, it, it comes to the same end. Um, okay, so this is uh, how the equivalence in pure metric uh, in pure gravity comes about. <clears throat> now let's include meta. <clears throat> and uh, first, let me again start with what I call the Palatini model. So the, the action that only sees the full Ricci scalar. <clears throat> so um, as before, we, we write down the full Ricci scalar. And now we include some meta. And for most of the talk, I will spe specialize to a real scalar field um, that I shall call H. And so the meta Lagrangian in this case would be the kinetic term and the potential term for the scalar field. Um, but what I'm going to say applies to all kinds of meta Lagrangians, where meta Lagrangian is defined as any contribution to the action that is insensitive to the connection, so to the Christoffel connection. Um, <clears throat> Okay, and now let me add one more ingredient, namely a non-minimal coupling of the scalar field to the Ricci, uh, uh, to, to the Ricci scalar. So this is the, the, the well-known term, Ricci scalar, scalar field squared. And then this term comes with a coefficient um, that I shall call xi. <clears throat> and um, now let's uh, uh, proceed as before. So let's split the Ricci scalar into torsion free contributions and torsion. So the pure gravitational part we already saw before. Um, so this leads to, uh, to these contributions. So the, the torsion free Ricci scalar plus torsion squared. And, and now the, we, we can do the same split for the non minimal coupling and we get uh, these three terms. So as before, the torsion-free Ricci scalar and the torsion squared. Um, but now the very important point is that the uh, derivative of torsion um, matters now. So because now this, this term is no, no longer is a, is a total derivative. And so uh, it's very important. And then before analyzing, we will do this, the same as before. So uh, generalize to arbitrary coefficients. So we see what kind of contributions uh, this action has. And um, then the, uh, we, we make the coefficients arbitrary. So this, this leads to arbitrary coefficients here in the pure gravitational part. And um, also for the non-minimal coupling. So before we only had one coefficient, but now for the different terms, we will take different coefficients. Um, and as I said before, so the C, C twiddle and Xi twiddle, they stand for several coefficients because they are several derivative of torsion terms and several torsion square terms. Um, okay, now let's take this action. So, so we are, we are inspired by uh, just the, 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 the Palatini action, so just the action with the Ricci scalar and the non-minimal coupling of the scalar field to the Ricci scalar. 
um, and then we arrive at this action. And then as before, let's, uh, let's analyze. So let's uh, derive the equations of motion for torsion. And now we see that in this model, torsion, torsion no longer vanishes. So this is due to, 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 to the, so this term here. Um, so that acts as a source term for torsion. When I vary with respect to torsion, that gives a, in, in the equations of motion a contribution that is not proportional to torsion. And that's why uh, torsion equals zero is not a solution anymore. Um, and so, so this term sources torsion. Um, and then we, we can see the parametric dependence. Um, so if I integrate this source term by parts, then I get this derivative of h squared. Um, this is, uh, and, and I see that it's proportional to the excite twiddle, so the, the proportion to the source strength. And then by dimensional analysis, it's clear that the term has to divide, be divided by a Planck squared to get a, a torsion of mass dimension one. Um, and then I can plug this solution back into the original action. So I take this solution for torsion, plug it back into, into the action. And um, then uh, I get the following theory. So the, um, the, the, the torsion free parts, of course, simply survive. So these two parts simply go here. Um, and now the, the other parts, so where, where torsion appears, um, I plug in the solution for torsion. Um, and all these terms have the same structure and lead uh, to a contribution of this form. So we see that we get dh squared squared, so or equivalently h squared dh squared. Um, we, we get uh, two powers of, of the, the coupling constant of the source. Um, we divide by Planck mass squared uh, to get uh, the, the correct mass dimension. Um, and then uh, there's some, uh, some, some additional function here um, that depends on the other uh, coupling constants on the C and the C twiddle. Um, and so the structure is, 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 is always like this, um, that I get a dimension six operator um, divided by, power, by, by Planck mass squared and multiplied by uh, the, the, the strength of the source. And so, uh, this is a very convenient method of analysis. So I start with the, the action that, that, that includes torsion. I solve for torsion, plug it back in, and then I get an equivalent theory um, that uh, only, so in which gravity is effectively torsionless. So in which I replaced the torsion by specific higher dimensional operators in the meta sector. So this is a fully equivalent theory. Um, but it's uh, it's very convenient because now in this theory, so this theory is equivalent to a theory in the metric formulation of gravity, and so this allows to to uh, use all the tools developed for for metric gravity. Um, and we will see explicitly uh, for the case of Higgs inflation how this goes. <clears throat> all right. So so as said, um, we. we just as a method of analysis, we can replace torsion by specific higher dimensional operators in the matter sector. And for the case of the scalar field, it's uh, corrections to the kinetic term of the scalar field. And uh, um, yeah, can I ask you a question? Uh, I'm a bit confused uh, about the criteria. Uh, so if you generalize the question that there is no how to say relation to the original curvature, right? Yeah. If uh, it, um, the question to satisfy the specific form, it can be uh, how to say back to the curvature expression, the uh, Einstein Hilbert form, right? So, no. so uh, I wonder, for example, if uh, whether uh, we can add some uh, function of the Torsion in this setup is it allowed or any or how to say you require something to um, yeah so I we can also dis discuss that that precisely maybe let's let's do this um, so uh, here I'm I'm showing the exact criteria that we're using um, and so we're arguing in terms of mass dimension. Um, so we're, we're requiring that in the gravitational sector, you should only have mass dimension two. 
Um, this is because uh, generic uh, higher mass dimensions will lead to additional propagating degrees of freedom. So for example, you, if you have mass dimension four, you can write something like this. So you can write a kinetic term for torsion and then it would propagate. And, and so we would break the equivalence uh, to, so even in pure gravity, we would break the equivalence and would not be a formulation anymore. Um, in, in the meta Lagrangian, we require renormalizability or equivalently mass dimension four. Um, and, in, and, and then also for the interactions of matter and gravity, we require the, the mass dimension four. So, so let me say what happens if we don't do that. So in the gravitational sector, we would generically allow for, for propagating torsion. But as you say, um, this is there are terms that would not lead to propagating torsion. So if you if you just put torsion to the power four, mm -hmm. um, so, so that this, uh, depending on the rest of the Lagrangian, does not lead uh, to additional propagating degrees of freedom. Um, and so uh, so our criteria are sufficient for requiring for, for achieving the equivalence. They, they are not necessary. So they are more general terms that um, that would uh, yeah would still lead to the equivalence. Also, why the master mention makes sense. So the criterion two, if if you were to drop that, then you could include from the very beginning higher dimensional operators in the matter sector. So then mm -hmm. you could uh, so if, if if more than master mention four is allowed, then you could include this dh squared squared from the very beginning, and then the whole procedure would be meaningless. So mm -hmm. so the, the, our procedure selects specific higher dimensional operators, and then if you go more general, then you have all the higher dimensional operators from the beginning, and then the yeah the procedure is meaningless. Um, okay, thank you. Sure. All right. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for the question. So this is uh, um, <clears throat> so the the motivation for for this criteria of constructing the action. So so why we take uh, uh, this specific form of the action. Um, and of course, uh, to, to, to add to that, um, this, this is an assumption. So this is the um, we are so we, we we motivate this assumption, and then we see where it leads us. And so it will lead to very concrete observable effects. And then in the end, uh, the observations will um, uh, can show if our assumptions uh, were a good starting point. All right, uh, and so, so I showed how to replace torsion by the specific higher dimension operators in the matter sector. Um, the scale um, of these higher dimensional operators is given generically by the Planck mass uh, divided by this non minimal coupling constant. So there can also be a different power of the coupling constant, but uh, this, this is not essential. Um, and um, we, the, 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 this action that I'm writing down here, so, so this action here uh, contains the metric and Palatini scenarios as special cases. Um, for metric, it's very obvious. So the metric scenario I obtain by simply, by only taking this part of the Lagrangian and setting all the other um, constants to zero. And so I can also within the einstein katan framework get the, 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 the metric scenario simply by setting all the coefficient of torsion terms uh, equal to zero. Um, and as shown before, I can also get the Palatini scenario by choosing the specific coefficients. So by, by replacing these, these arbitrary coefficients here by specific values. Um, and in this way, this, this action uh, contains the Palatini scenario. Um, and, and, and I would argue it is a very natural generalization of these two. So if I, if I write them together and then I see, okay, it's these specific coefficient choices and then let me explore the arbitrary coefficients. Um, okay, I'm gonna briefly show one slide about uh, the actual computation. So, so now it was very symbolic. Um, so for the actual computation, we start with the torsion. So this is a tensor with three indices. Um, and then we can decompose it into irreducible representations. Um, namely, we can form a vector by contracting uh, two of the indices. Um, there's only one contraction because of the anti-symmetry of torsion. So the other contractions are equivalent or vanish. Um, then also we can uh, multiply uh, the, the uh, torsion by the anti-symmetric tensor. And in this way, we can derive an, an axial vector. 
And finally, we have a pure tensor part that is defined by uh, subtracting from the full torsion the two vector contributions. And then with these irreducible representations, I can, uh, can uh, 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 write down the action according to the criteria discussed above. So in the first line, we have the purely metric part. And then here we have the source terms. So we build a derivative of one of, uh, of the one of the vectors and multiply it um, by the scalar field. And then we see that we have two source terms here for the two vector contributions. Um, and then there are many quadratic contributions in torsion. So for example, I can, I can multiply one vector with itself. And then the quadratic contribution has two coefficients, so one purely gravitational coefficient and one coefficient for a non-minimal coupling to the scalar field. And then these quadratic contributions, there are many more um, that, that I'm not showing here. And then for einstein katan um, so if I write down this this, this full, full generic, like, like this, is, if I write down the dot, dot, dots here, so all the contributions, um, then solve for torsion, plug the result back into the action, um, then the, the final answer uh, is shown here. So we see that the, the purely uh, metric part simply gets copied below. And then the specific higher dimensional operator that I get to torsion has this form. So it's a correction to the kinetic term um, as discussed before, suppressed by, by Planck mass squared. Um, and then uh, we, we see that it has a specific, uh, so it's uh, like it's a fraction with specific polynomials of uh, as functions of h squared, um, where we have two coefficients in the numerator and three coefficients in the denominator. Um, these coefficients contain all the coupling constants of the initial action, so they are determined by all the coupling constants of the initial action, and in particular by the source terms. So here we, we get this, this contributions proportional to the so source strength. Um, and now what we can do with uh, the, this uh, um, um, this co uh, co um, correction to the kinetic term is count the three parameters. So we see that we have two from the numerator, three from the denominator, um, but the co common rescaling removes one of the parameters. Uh, and we have the, 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 the metric non-minimal coupling. So we see that um, the, in, in einstein katan theory, we get five parameters for the non-minimal coupling. So, um, and then as said before, the motivation, uh, the, 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 the spirit here is that, um, let me take all terms that are on the same footing as the non-minimal coupling in the metric scenario, and then uh, see how many more terms I, uh, like this I get in einstein katan and then from the Einstein-Katan perspective, all these five parameters on the same footing. So if you buy the non-minimal coupling to the, the torsion-free Ricci scalar, you are forced to buy also the other four non-minimal couplings. All right. Um, and then to wrap up on the, the different versions of gravity. Um, so, so far we discussed the, the Einstein-Katan formulation. We saw why it is equivalent to metric GR and pure gravity, but uh, leads to um, distinct predictions um, once you include matter. So we discussed the example of the scalar field. Um, so now we, so we, we, we said before that einstein katan is defined by including curvature and torsion, but assuming a priori that non-metricity vanishes. So the uh, vanishing of non-metricity can, can, can be seen as the, defi def the defining criterion of einstein katan um, and then, of course, this uh, contains as a special case the metric formulation and the metric formulation being defined by both torsion and non metricity vanishing. Um, also, we saw that einstein katan contains what we can call the Palatini scenario. Um, so this is, is a theory that includes uh, uh, curvature and torsion. Um, but with a specific Lagrangian, so the, the Lagrangian that only sees the Ricci scalar. Um, I put it in gray because it's in the uh, discussion that we're having here, it's not a formulation, so it's not defined by a specific geometry, but it's defined by a specific action. Um, okay, what else is there? Well, um, the, the most natural thing you can do is to remove all the assumptions. So to, to also not make any assumption about non-metricity, and that leads to the metric affine formulation where 
you have curvature, torsion, and non metricity. And then, of course, you can do the opposite of Einstein Katan. So you can uh, exclude uh, torsion but include non metricity. Mm -hmm. And that can be called Val gravity. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you see that there, there's also some symmetry between Einstein Katan and, and Weil. And, and indeed, for the specific actions that we consider, Einstein Katan gravity and Weil gravity uh, lead to exactly the same predictions. Um, and then from this picture, I would argue that uh, the, 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 the most interesting formulation is, is the metric affine gravity since you avoid any a priori assumption. So it's, it's not clear why you should assume that torsion vanishes or you should assume that non-metricity vanishes. And so um, the, the metric affine formulation stands out because it does not require any a priori assumption. So all the geometric quantities are determined dynamically. Um, and then we also studied the, the, the metric uh, affine uh, theory. And so I can, can show you also the full Lagrangian in this case. So it's of course much longer than in the einstein katan case because I have all the torsion terms, all the non-metricity terms and the mixed terms. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, so I, I can show you more about this if you're interested. Um, for now, let, ah, yeah. and let's, let's do the parameter counting. So we saw that, um, so the, the count, the, the, the number of parameters for the non-minimal coupling. Um, so we saw that in metric and palatini, you only have one parameter. So that is the coefficient of the uh, of the h squared r term. And and before I already showed that um, instead of this one non-minimal coupling coefficient, um, you have five such coefficients in einstein katan And now um, in so, so in y, in the while case we also have five coefficients so we said for our specific choice of action einstein katan and while lead to the same predictions and in the metric affine case i get 13 such coefficients so instead of the one coefficient for the non-minimal coupling i had in, in metric gr i get now these 13 coefficients in in metric in the metric affine theory um and and so this is not necessarily a desirable feature. So I, I, I did not ask for these coefficients, um, but it's, it's it's sort of unavoidable. But for, from this perspective, um, so all the, the formulations are equivalent, and then the metric affine uh, may even be the, the, the most uh, natural one, since it, it does not require any assumption about the geometry, and it contains all the other formulations as special cases. Um, but then, we, we, we analyze the theory and what the theory tells us is that there are many such non-minimal coupling coefficients. And so if you buy one of them, there's, I don't see any reason to exclude any of the other. I have a, um, a question before you continue. Uh, so actually, if you uh, treat uh, all the non-minimal coupling to be independent, uh, do you think uh, diffeomorphism invariance uh, I mean the the metric. Uh, I mean the the, the space-time interval is independent of the frames. The general covariance, I mean general diffeomorphism invariance is lost in some way, or um, do you think uh, there's no uh, issue? Um, I, I mean, no, no, I, so the, the, like the theory that that we're writing down is is uh, still has the, the diffeomorphism invariance for the metric. Mm. Um, and then to, to go in the direction of, of your question, um, of course, you, you can, for example, say, well, non-metricity means that, that my, my length scales are relative. So that uh, if I have a ruler here, it will be different than a ruler there. And if I, and, 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 the, the, and I cannot compare because it, it's not integrable. It depends on the, on the path. Mm. And so this was Einstein's original objection to, to, to non-metricity. So there was, there was a discussion between Weil and Einstein in 1918 already, where, where Einstein said, okay, but then, um, we observe the, the, the absolute length scale. So how can you have non-metricity? Um, but uh, sort of from, from the analysis we've just shown, we see why this is the case. Um, because the, the theory with non-metricity is equivalent to a metric theory with higher dimensional operators. 
where the effects are suppressed by this, this energy scale and Planck over the non-minimal coupling. And so it means this non-metricity only shows up at high energies. So, so it's, it's fully consistent that at low energies, we observe the absolute length scales. Um, and then this effect would only show up at sufficiently high energies. Mm, okay. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, let, let me summarize on the formulations. Um, so in total, um, we get seven formulations of GR. So, so how seven? Um, so we already saw before the four with curvature. So, so once you include curvature, you can include to or not torsion, include or not non-metricity. This gives four options. These were the metric of fine Einstein, Cartan, Weil, and, and metric gravity. Um, also, you can exclude curvature and then include torsion and or non-metricity. These are the teleparallel formulations of gravity. Um, I'm not going to discuss them here, um, but just to, to, to point out, this is also an option. And then, then there are three options. Um, and, and, and then, yeah, the, the seven was to be expected from the beginning. So we have three geometric concepts that we inclu can include or not. This gives eight possibilities. Of course, including excluding all of them is, uh, will not lead to a theory of gravity. And so we have eight minus one, the seven formulations of uh, GR. Um, and then we saw that uh, generically they contain uh, numerous non manual couplings. So instead of the unique one in, in the metric theory, we get many. And um, we see that the, the effect of torsion and non-metricity is equivalent to terms suppressed by Planck mass divided by the, the non-minimal coupling. Um, and now once you are in the situation, um, yeah, and, and, and so this, this, the, the torsion and non-metricity act as a selection criterion for the higher dimensional operators. So even if you start with a metal Lagrangian that is renormalizable, um, torsion and non-metricity will lead to some, uh, so some very specific non-renormalizable terms. Um, and now, yeah, once you see this, 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 uh, the, the, that effects um, are given like this, there are generically two options. Um, the first one is that all these non-minimal coupling constants are, are order one or smaller. Um, in this case, the, the effect only shows up uh, above the Planck scale. Um, and then it's of lesser importance because we know that at the Planck scale, we, we, we need some, some unknown effect of a UV completion of gravity in any case. And so these, uh, the, 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 these effects uh, generically are um, less important. Um, and the other option is that some of the coupling constants are large. Um, and in this case, um, we, uh, yeah, so, so, so the, the, the theory that we get has the undesirable feature of many unknown coupling constants. So I have these, these many non-minimal coupling constants, and then this leads to a degree of arbitrariness um, so that, that I have uh, uh, many coupling constants. I know, don't know how to fix a priori, but my predictions depend on these coupling constants. And so this is not necessarily a desirable feature. But, but as I just argued, it's an unavoidable feature. So because of the ambiguity of GR due to the formulations, um, yeah, the, the theory tells us um, that this is the case. Um, and now once you have some of the, the, the non-minimal coupling constants uh, much larger than one, then the effects will show up uh, at a scale much below the Planck scale. And then we can have observable effects in the early universe. Um, and so to formulate in the other way, so um, we saw that if you have one non-minimal coupling constant, you have many, and then your natural attitude may be to exclude all of them or, or choose all of them at most one, because you don't want to have this ambiguity. Um, but then you exclude many effects, uh, uh, many physical effects. And um, so in, in particular, you would exclude Higgs inflation. Um, and uh, this is how I will transition to the um, second part of the talk, namely the phenomenological implications and in particular for Higgs inflation. Before that, I want to ask if there are any questions. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, it's related to the uh, previous my question. But the, you mentioned the derivative of the torsion produced additional degree of freedom, right? So uh, is, is it healthy or is it ghost-like? 
Um, so for generic coefficients, it's ghost-like. So, so if you if you include, uh, so if you make torsion propagating, so include a term like this, then for like there's many of these terms, and then for generic choices, you you always have ghosts. Um, but there are very specific choices for which you don't have ghosts. So there's um, so it's it's like uh, I mean there, there there's a lot of literature on that. Um, mostly for the torsion case, but also for the metric affine case. And so generic coefficients lead to ghosts, but you can analyze and see all the conditions for vanishing ghosts. And then there are specific coefficients for which they are healthy. So in, in your formulation, uh, yeah, you derive the uh, effective field theory dynamically, but the torsion appears as the auxiliary field. So I wonder we can uh, extend the uh, torsion to the real dynamical degree of freedom. And uh, then we can consider the effective field theory uh, below some uh, mass scale. Uh, I wonder such possibilities uh, yeah, allow them. Th 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 there's definitely a possibility and, and there are works uh, that, that follow this route. And um, yeah, so yeah, uh, once you include this, this the, the, the once you make torsion dynamically, then this is uh, um, you you will see at this like the yeah at this uh, at this scale you will see additional propagating degrees of freedom of torsion. So that will be the mass scale of the propagating torsion, and then above the scale you will excite this degree of freedom. Um, and that can also be interesting that there there are attempts to UV complete gravity in this way. So you. If the torsion becomes dynamically below the Planck scale, then maybe you can avoid going to the Planck scale, something like this. Um, so I, I would say there's a, as a less strong motivation for going to the, into this route because it's not equivalent to to, to the metric GR. So so kind of well, in this talk, I want to follow the minimal route and only consider those theories that are equivalent, so only these theories that yeah are forced upon me. Um, and so this is a modification of, of GR, but of course it's possible and, and people have considered that. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, Excuse me, uh, when I say your non-minimal couplings uh, in the, after taking the re irreducible, uh, irreducible representation of the torsion tensor, you have a vectors, two vectors, right? So T alpha and T at alpha, alpha. And then there, there you have a C1 term, C1. Yep. It looks like a gauge, gauge boson mass, massive gauge boson for T alpha. And um, only if there's a proper, uh, if there's a kinetic if term. It is propagating, if it is propagating, if you ignore yeah. the kinetic terms. Uh, so uh, if you, you take the massive, use? yeah, yeah, if you take the massive gauge theory, uh, the just to, if you ignore the connected term for the massive gauge theory, you get this kind of uh, effective interaction. And uh, it looks like uh, because we also worked on uh, biogravity before. And when, when I see under also the uh, Xi1 and Xi2, and for instance, Xi2, uh, if you combine Xi2 and C1, those terms, looks like. Um, by gravity, I mean, it looks very similar to by gravity uh, 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 um, interactions. So, do you have, do you make make any comment on that in your paper, like uh, Einstein Cartan to by gravity? Um, so, so the, the the comment we're making in the paper is that mm -hmm. for for this. The, this this selection criteria for the actions or for the, the type of scenarios we're considering mm -hmm. the einstein katan and weil are fully equivalent so you can so also the the, the non-metricity has two vectors uh, so so if, if you do the de decomposition of non-metricity you also get two vectors so they are both non-axial but this is not important here and so you can just identify the one vector of torsion with the one ah, vector yeah. of non-metricity and the yeah. other vector with the other vector mm -hmm. And then it's it's fully equivalent. Uh, fully equivalent. I see. So then, okay. then, then in, on on one side in biogravity you have uh, local conformal transformations, right? Then okay. do you think that there is a counterpart of the kind of gauge transformation uh, in the non sorry non metric non torsion part, right? The Einstein Cartan hmm. gravity. Yeah, so that, can you expect such a local gauge transformation? Yeah. yeah. 
um, so there's uh, um, so you I mean there, there's also works on this and we, we even had uh, also a paper or like a paper touching on this um, and and so as you say one of the the vectors of non metricity can act as, as the while vector to, to make the conformal transformations local mm -hmm. and also a specific combination of the torsion vectors can do it or maybe even one of the torsion vectors so mm -hmm. so i mean you, you just follow this identification mm -hmm. and so so whoever of, of these guys uh, is mm -hmm. responsible for the local conformal transformation and then you identify with the the, 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 the torsion and so you you can definitely do that in einstein Katar. Mm -hmm. okay yeah, yeah. and so nice that's also yeah. related to um, the the protective symmetry of of the of the the Einstein Cartan action. So I, I don't know if you, if you followed this discussion. So there is, you, you can shift uh, the connection. So there, there's a specific uh, transformation of the connections or the Christopher symbol going to um, this. Yes, C is an arbitrary vector, and then the Einstein Cartan action. Um, well, for specific choices of the action, so that depends on the action, um, the action is invariant under this projective transformation. So in particular, the Palatini case is invariant under this. Um, and that is, and, and this effectively maps torsion to non-matricity. So in this mm -hmm. way, so, so this projective transformation tells you how to map the vial vector uh, of non-matricity to the torsion vector. I see. So, so this is the C beta is the gauge transformation for yes, non-matricity. Non on metri metricity gauge gauge transformation right um this yeah yeah okay yeah i said okay i say i understand okay thank you yeah but you also can yeah you can use the torsion vector as you said as as uh, as the y vector so mm -hmm, this... mm -hmm. i see okay all right um, then let me go to to inflation. So just because we're switching gears, um, one slide on, on, on introducing inflation. Um, so as, as we all know, um, we observe that the universe on very large scales is homogeneous and isotropic. And um, the, the initial perturbations that seeded all the structures in the universe were very small and nearly scale invariant. Um, and then, of course, the, the question is, how, how does the universe get to the state? And then one possibility uh, is inflation, so an early phase of exponential expansion of the universe um, that will make the universe homogeneous and isotropic. And then the, the quantum fluctuations in this state uh, are the seeds for the nearly scale invariant perturbations. And then the open question is, what is the inflaton? So, so some degree of freedom must have carried the energy responsible for this exponential expansion. And that, that is the inflaton. And then the open question is, uh, who was the inflaton? And uh, you generically have two possibilities. So either you already have seen the inflaton or you have not. Um, and so, so it's a known degree of freedom or not. And then the only scalar that we know in the standard model is the Higgs boson. And so uh, the, the proposal was made uh, to uh, use the Higgs boson as the inflaton. And then um, since we have not found any additional particles beyond the standard model, despite intensive searches over decades, uh, the, I would argue that the scenario of Higgs inflation has become even more interesting. And um, so let's study that. Um, Originally, Higgs inflation was proposed in the metric formulation of gravity, and soon after, the Palatini scenario was studied. So I'm, I'm showing the original papers here. Um, let me briefly review uh, the, um, the, the known scenarios of Higgs inflation. Um, so we start from in both cases, the same action. So we have the purely gravitational part as usual. Um, we have uh, the, the meta part of, of the Higgs boson, where um, we have the kinetic term and then the, the four point interaction of the Higgs. Um, I'm neglecting the electroweak vacuum expectation value since uh, it's not essential for inflation. Um, and then uh, we add this non manual coupling term here that, that we already saw before. So the h squared coupling to the Ricci scalar with the coefficient psi. 
Um, and then let me call uh, this bracket here uh, omega squared. Um, and then one way to analyze this theory is what I did before. So to split the Ricci scalar in torsion free part and uh, um, torsion contribution, solve for torsion, plug back in. Um, it turns out this is not the most convenient way for this specific action. So much easier is just a conformal transformation of the metric. Um, and so let me first discuss the Palatini scenario here. So in the Palatini scenario, um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the Christ uh, Christoffel symbol is independent of the metric. And so the conformal transformation does not affect the uh, Ricci tensor. Um, and so I can just perform this conformal transformation in one line. So the determinant of the metric gives me a contribution omega to the minus four. Um, and then the inverse metric contained in the Ricci scalar gives me an omega squared. And so I see omega squared, omega squared, omega to the minus four. Um, I'm removing the non-minimal coupling to the Ricci scalar. This was the goal um, of the conformal transformation. Um, also, the uh, kinetic term contains an inverse metric. So for the, uh, and then the, the, this omega squared here combines with the omega to the minus four to give the one over omega squared for the kinetic term. And finally, the potential only sees the, uh, uh, the determinant of the metric. And, and so we uh, uh, divide by omega to the power of four. Um, and so in this way, yeah, sorry, in this way, um, we, we also removed torsion. So we, we, we go uh, since, uh, yeah, in, in this theory, we have no non minimal coupling anymore. So torsion is not sourced anymore. So here it doesn't make any difference if I assume vanishing of torsion or not. And, and so again, this is an equivalent theory in the metric formulation. Um, and, and then we see that uh, this here is the specific higher order operator in the meta sector. Um, this was for the Palatini case. For the metric case, the, the Christoffel symbol does depend on the metric. And so the conformal transformation gives an additional contribution that I'm showing in gray here. Um, and so um, this action is the starting point for the analysis of, of metric or Palatini Higgs inflation. Um, yeah, we immediately see why it may be suited for inflation. So if I take, uh, uh, the, the, um, so if I go to large energies, then the omega to the four will go to a size squared h to the four. And so I'm getting a flat potential. And then uh, the, the flat potential, of course, is, 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 a, is a way to implement the, the slow roll inflation. Um, I'm not going to show the inflation analysis here. So this is, is a completely standard computation that, that truly also you know. Um, and I will simply say what is the result. Uh, so for uh, uh, the the um, so we have one free parameter in this action. So the so the initial action here has has the one free parameter that a priori we don't know, um, but we know the observational requirement of matching the amplitude of scalar perturbations in the CMB. So in the CMB, CMB we can see what is the strength of of perturbations, and it is this delta t over t uh, on the order of ten to the minus five. And from this, we can deduce um, the, the non-minimal coupling Psi. For the metric case, we get Psi on the order of 10 to the three. For Palatini, it's larger 10 to the seven. And now once we fix the Psi, um, we have a model with fully determined parameters. And for this model, we can, can compute all the inflationary observables. Um, and uh, before that, what is very important is that um, we need the non-minimal coupling. So a priori, we, we don't know. Um, we, 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 we could have tried to do Higgs inflation without the non-minimal coupling, um, but the, the compatibility, compatibility of observations tells us that uh, Higgs inflation needs the non-minimal coupling. If I exclude, and, and so this, 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 this connects to what I said before. So he, if I exclude the non-minimal coupling, I don't get Higgs inflation. But once I include the non-minimal coupling, then I will have all kinds of non-minimal couplings. So that um, the, the no large non-minimal coupling scenario doesn't work for Higgs inflation. And so I'm exactly in this situation where I need some non-minimal coupling. And that's why I see this ambiguity of all the other non-minimal couplings. Um, 
let me show the results uh, for metric and Palatini uh, Hicks inflation. Um, so I'm showing here the observations by Planck, uh, Bicep and, uh, and Keck. Um, so for the two most important inflationary observables. So the one is the spectral index. So that determines the deviation of scale invariance. Uh, so, so how much the perturbations deviate from scale invariance. So the spectral index one is fully scale invariant and deviation from one is a deviation from scale invariance. And the other one is the tensor to scalar ratio. So that is the amplitude of primordial gravitational waves relative to the amplitude of scalar perturbations. Um, the spectral index we have uh, measured very precisely. So by, by Planck, um, so between 0.96 and 0.97 something. Um, the, the primordial gravitational waves we have famously not observed. And so we only have a upper bound on the tensor to scalar ratio. And then, so I'm showing a logarithmic scale here. And so the, the bound is something like 0 0.04. Um, and now uh, you can see what are the predictions of metric and Palatini Higgs inflation. Um, so the uh, spectral index is very similar. Something, yeah. In the, in the allowed window. And the tensor to scalar ratio in both cases is, is very small. So for the metric we have uh, on the order of 10 to the minus three. So that is already very small and, and very challenging to observe. And for the Palatini scenario, we get even a much smaller tensor to scalar ratio of 10 to the minus 10. Um, and let me say that the spectral index in both cases is described by the same formula, the one minus two over n, so that, that is shared by many inflationary scenarios. And the n is the number of e-foldings before the end of inflation where CMB is generated. Um, but the n depends on uh, the, the reheating temperature and the dynamics of reheating, and that is different in metric and Palatini, and that's why the numerical value of n is slightly different, and that's why the two points are not on the same place. So the spectral index is slightly different in the two scenarios and one might even hope by very precise measurements of the spectral index to distinguish between the two scenarios. Um, all right, so that was the review. Now let's uh, go to, uh, to uh, um, go beyond the metric and Palatini formulation. Um, and for this talk, I will uh, confine myself to, to a very simple extension. So I will only add one of the many possible terms. So, so I'm, I'm taking the axial torsion vector here and uh, the axial torsion vector um, uh, with a source term of the Higgs field. So it was one of the terms I showed before. Um, from the discussion before, it's, it's clear that this is a very specific choice. So there's many possible terms and I'm just taking one term here. Um, there's some motivation for this term. You, 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 so it's uh, like uh, the, the term itself here is the topological Nian invariant. And that gave us some motivation to study this scenario initially. But from, from today's perspective, I would say there's, this term is not preferred to any of the other terms that you can include. Um, and now for this action, we can do um, what I outlined before. So we can uh, solve for torsion. So we, we split the R into uh, torsion, uh, into torsion free contribution and torsion. We solve for torsion and plug the result back into the action. Um, let me simply show the, uh, uh, the result here. Um, so so uh, first we can discuss the special cases. So if I uh, exclude this term here, um, then this term will, will go away and I'm in the Palatini scenario. So that is um, how it should be. Um, what is very interesting is that a specific choice of, of this term here um, uh, gets me back to the matrix scenario. So if I uh, choose the Xi eta equal Xi, so there's, there's no particular motivation for that, but just the observation is if I do that, <clears throat> then the action is equivalent to uh, uh, metric Higgs inflation. And, um, excuse me. Mm. Um, okay, so we, we, we start from this action where we add just one of the possible terms. Um, then we, we, we get this equivalent metric theory. 
and um, now we can analyze inflation for this theory. Um, and of course, it will be slightly different than metric and Palatini scenarios um, because I have two coupling constants now. I have the, uh, the xi contained here and I have the xi eta. And, and then the constraint, the CB constraint of matching the amplitude of perturbations only fixes one of the two. So I still have some freedom in the model. And so the result of the inflation analysis looks as follows. Um, so I'm plotting on the axis here, the two coupling constants uh, in logarithmic scale again. And um, then uh, the CMB constraint will give me a line in this two dimensional plot. So once I choose one of the coefficients, the other one is fixed by CMB. Um, and so the, the colored line is the, the allowed scenarios by CMB. And uh, <laughs> the color represents the tensor to scalar ratio. So, so, so as, uh, as one can expect that the, the spectral index is largely invariant, but the tensor to scalar ratio uh, <laughs> changes according to the coupling constants. And so I can um, first identify the special cases. So if I take the xi eta very small, so vanishing xi eta, I go to Palatini. So Palatini sits here. If I take xi eta and xi on the same order, then um, I go to the matrix scenario. So that is about here. And so the colors match. So the, the Palatini scenario gives the tens of the scalar ratio 10 to the minus 10, metric 10 to the minus 3. And what we see now is that there's a continuous interpolation between the two scenarios. So I can have uh, any tensor to scalar ratio between metric and Palatini. And also I can go on the other side of the metric scenario. So I can go to larger tensor to scalar ratios. <laughs> and already from, from this plot here, we see that metric and Palatini are just some very specific points in a general parameter space. And um, so it's not clear why one should prefer the metric or the Palatini case. Um, and so in, in general, we see that uh, Higgs inflation does not make a prediction for the tensor to scalar ratio. But the prediction of the tensor to scalar ratio depends on the formulation of gravity that we don't know. Um, and so there's, there's no definite prediction. For, for example, there's the statement that a detection of gravitational waves would exclude Higgs inflation. And then this is not true because there's also the scenarios here where the uh, gravitational waves are detectable in the near future. <clears throat> and so let me show the predictions again in, 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 the, in the CMB constraints. Um, so the <clears throat> spectral index again stays at the one minus two over N. So with this uncertainty of N that, that uh, can only be fixed by studying preheating precisely. Um, but the tensor to scalar ratio spans anything between the 10 to the minus 10 of uh, Palatini, the 10 to the minus 3 of metric and also larger. We see that some of the scenarios are already excluded. So, so this tensor to scalar ratio is above the observational bound. Um, and we see that there's these, these interesting scenarios just below the observational bound where the detection of gravitational waves is possible in the near future. So it's, there's nothing preferred about these scenarios, but just to say that there's no definite prediction about the tensor to scalar ratio. Um, and then just for the sake of beauty, um, let me add one more term. So I'm, I'm not showing which term I'm adding here, but just let me add one more of the possible coupling constants. Um, then I get a three dimensional plot for the three different coupling constants. And CMB constrains me to a two dimensional surface in this three dimensional plot. Um, and then we see that there's, uh, for example, a Palatini region here. There's a metric region here. Um, so what we before we saw the, the the lower plane. So this was the, the plot we saw before. Um, here are the scenarios with tensor to scalar ratio that is above the observational bound. Um, yeah, just to sh so show that such an analysis can be done. Um, but, but again, this is only including two of the additional terms and, and there are many more terms. Um, so let me summarize on Higgs inflation. Um, so we, we see that beyond the special cases uh, of metric gravity and maybe Palatini gravity, um, the parameter space is very large. 
and only some parts have been have been studied so far. So I'm also citing two more papers here. Uh, so there's a group in Finland uh, very active in the studies. Um, and so, so far, only small parts of parameter space have been studied. Um, it is interesting that in most cases, uh, the result is, uh, so first of all, in most cases, inflation is possible. So this is a priori an interesting feature. So you have many uh, coupling constants. So you might think that for some of them, inflation is not possible. You develop local minima or something like this. Um, this is not the case. So um, the, uh, uh, um, for, for more, for, so in large parts of parameter space, inflation is possible and also consistent with observations. Um, namely, this 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 uh, attractor formula uh, one minus two over n often appears, um, and um, so we, we saw that uh, because of the, these ambiguities of GR, Higgs inflation does not make a definite prediction for the tensor to scalar ratio, uh, and for many other observables. Um, but you can can turn the argument around and say Higgs inflation is the perfect probe of gravity. So if Higgs inflation was really realized in nature, um, then uh, because it's so sensitive to the choice of formulation, um, measure, precisely measuring different observables of inflation then would be the perfect way to fix this ambiguity and to see what formulation of gravity is realized and what is the fundamental, fundamental, fundamental nature of GR. Um, and just as a brief outlook, let me say that the analysis of quantum effects may also help to distinguish between different scenarios. Um, namely, it's known that the Palatini um, Higgs inflation has a higher vacuum cutoff than the metric scenario. Um, and uh, this is very important um, because this high cutoff makes it possible to study heating perturbatively. So this is, is not possible in the metric scenario and the metric scenario even seems that preheating is sensitive to the UV completion. Um, and this is not the case in Palatini. In Palatini, you can, can study preheating within the theory itself. And I would say that is a very strong advantage or maybe even a consistency requirement. Um, and so it's, uh, uh, so this, the study of the cutoff or the, the um, may, maybe one of the way to distinguish between the two, between the different scenarios or to select preferred scenarios. So in particular, yeah, yeah so. Um, so far, we know that the Palatini scenario uh, has this, this, this desirable feature. Um, also, an additional bonus, um, in, in one of the papers, we showed that um, once you have the high cutoff, and so once you can study preheating perturbatively, um, the, the RG running of coupling constants in the standard model uh, may be valid up to inflationary energies. Um, and in this way, you can connect uh, collider measurements, so in particular the top you cover coupling to inflationary observables. So this is a unique opportunity to connect these two very different energy domains. Um, and so, yeah, the, the study of quantum effects may may uh, also have some uh, so hold some possibility to uh, distinguish between the two scenarios. But I think most of all. Uh, we should see it the other way around and say X inflation is the perfect probe of gravity. And so if that is realized, then the inflationary observables will tell us about the fundamental nature of gravity. Um, this concludes the Higgs inflation part. Are there any questions about this? Hi, may I ask? I naive question yeah uh yeah so you said that uh like for most parameters there is like a compatible it is compatible with inflation yeah so what do you mean by so like so what what happens like, what 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 about the parameters that don't give like inflation like is there like a deformation in the potential that doesn't give like correct cmb uh, observables or is it just like basically impossible to have inflation there yeah, I see the question. Um, so there, there's different possibilities. Um, the first one, so, so we, we can always think of the Einstein frame potential. So we, mm -hmm. we, we remove the non-minimal coupling, we integrate out uh, torsion, and then we, we go to this minimal couple theory with the deformed potential. And so the Einstein frame potential for the metric and, uh, for, yeah, uh, no, let, let, 
let's not show the formulas, but yeah, we can think in the terms of the Einstein frame potential. So that is the actual potential that the, the inflaton sees. And um, then in, in metric Palatini, it looks something like this. Um, and then what can happen is that you get a step in the potential. And then, I mean, depending on terminology, but now if, if C, like if, if the 50 E foldings corresponding to CMB are here, then you're not in inflation. So you're, you're not in slow roll. So, um, so like if you said like there's like a step in the potential, is that like a generic feature for the parameters that don't like give successful e full? I mean, like successful can be measurement because I don't know if there's like a degree of freedom to like shift that position of the step in the potential. But usually, yeah. if that step in the potential is like in the smaller scale, it can give like several like phenomenological like uh, implications. Let's like say if there's like a uh, like a step in the potential on the smaller scale, like smaller field values, there might be like gravitational wave production or uh, yeah. parameter black holes. Could there be like a connection to the parameters that you choose to like some certain like, like parameter black hole masses or something like that? That, that is a, it's an excellent question. Um, mm -hmm. So um, we're thinking about that and possibly yes. So, so as you mm -hmm. say, that, like, I mean, Many scenarios don't even have such a step, but certain mm -hmm. scenarios do. And then the position of the step you can think of as a free parameter. So it somehow depends on the parameters that you have. And then, of course, you can shift it. If you mm -hmm. put it right at CMB, then you're incompatible with CMB. Mm -hmm. But if, if, as you say, you put it to the smaller scale, so let's put, let's put it here and CMB is here, um, then it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it may give um, some feature. So because it's like it, it, it never goes to a minimum. So, so it never, oh. yeah, so maybe I, that, that is bad drawing, but um, so, so the, it can, can be like this, but mm -hmm. what it does not do is something like this. Um, so this we don't get, um, mm -hmm. and then of course this could make inflation impossible. So if this is a deep, deep minimum, then you don't get out of that. Mm -hmm. And if it's a very shallow minimum, that is exactly how you would produce gravitation waves in primordial black holes. Mm -hmm. It seems it does not do that. Um, oh, so, so like the maximum deformation is just like an inflection point. It just can't have a local minimum or something like that. Um, I, I think that's true. So, so I'm, I mean, I, we haven't thought too much about it. So, so I mean, mm -hmm. like check yourself. Um, but but I think uh, this is true. So kind of the, 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 there's two sides of the same coin. So it says inflation is generically possible. So you don't get trapped in the local minimum, but that also means, okay, you don't get a shallow local minimum and you don't get many of the interesting observational effects. Okay. So what you can get also is a pole so that mm -hmm. the, the uh, potential or, or let me here now show just the kinetic function, so the, the coefficient, so the k of h is the coefficient of, of the kinetic term. Um, and then what it can do is to give a pole, something like this. Um, but then, okay, you, you should start inflation here. And then, mm -hmm. like, of course, you, you, should, you can never go over the pole. And so there's some excluded field range for h, if that is the case. Oh, sorry, so this is h and k of h. And so if you have a pole, then some range of h would be excluded, but inflation would still be possible. So then it's, it's large field inflation or, or some pole inflation, but yeah, that, that, that is also something that can happen. But I, I don't think it's, well, yeah, it, it does give many effects. I mean, it just makes the field range of h finite, and then you start left of the pole and, and you, you still have inflation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so how, how fast should I wrap up? Uh, so uh, we, we already had quite some discussion and so maybe let, let me ask, uh, I, I can also almost straight go to the conclusion if, if you prefer that. Um, you, you're muted, Shuntaro. Yeah, uh, how, how many slides do you have? Maybe. Yeah, it's five minutes. Okay, okay, okay. Please, please. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so <laughs> I was expecting that it will be late at this point, so I'm, I'm very short here on, on the outlook to other phenomenological implications. Um, so far, we only discussed the, the, the coupling to a scalar field, and then the scalar field in, in the standard model can be the Higgs field. Um, what is also very interesting, maybe even more interesting in the presence of torsion or non-metricity are fermions. Um, so let me take a fermion psi and then see how we can couple that to torsion. So before we saw these terms, uh, these the source terms for torsion, where torsion couples to the derivative of, uh, of the scalar field. Um, and now you can, uh, so once you have the fermion, you can couple it to a fermionic current. So we have the fermionic vector current and the fermionic axial current. And then just, it's a game of, 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 of building Lorentz invariant uh, terms. So con con contracting all the indices. And then you see that instead of coupling the torsion to the d mu psi, you can couple the torsion to the psi bar gamma mu psi. Um, and so in the same way that the, the scalar field can source torsion, the fermion can source torsion. Uh, and then we play the same game. We solve for torsion, plug it back in the original theory, see what kind of terms we get. And then it's again six dimensional terms. Um, so it's uh, so suppressed by a Planck mass squared. And then the six dimensional term is a four fermion interaction. So it's always a fermion field to, to the fourth power. Um, and then, of course, this interaction strength is controlled by the non minimal couplings that I put uh, in my original action. And so I see that by coupling fermions to torsion and or non metricity, I get uh, for uh, a four fermion interaction. And depending on the, the parameters, this four fermion interaction can be active much below the Planck scale. Um, and uh, of course, gravity is universal, so it couples uh, to all species and to, to all fields, and so there's uh, a universal four fermion interaction. Um, and it's also very interesting that this four fermion interaction, uh, so that was already discussed uh, in, in, in the 60s, in particular by, uh, yeah, so it was even earlier. And, and so because it already is contained in the covariant, in the full covariant derivative. So if you write uh, the, the, the kinetic term for fermions and then take this here, so, so the, the, in the covariant derivative, take the full connection, then you source torsion already for the Palatini action. So that the action that only sees the full um, Christoffel symbol will source the, the four Fermi interaction. Um, okay, and then one uh, interesting application is the production of fermionic dark matter. So let's say we have psi here standard model fermions that have been populated after preheating. And then let me add to the standard model a singlet fermion N. Um, so this can be a right-handed neutrino, and that is one very strong motivation for considering singular fermions, um, that they can, can also give the mass to the observed neutrinos via the seesaw mechanism. Um, and so, let me, but, but for now, let's add any singular fermion. It may be a right-handed neutrino, it may be something else. And then because of this universal for fermion interaction, I can have processes where two of the standard model fermions in Hele producing two of the uh, singular fermions. And this process is active in the early universe. Um, and so we can have, uh, so this gives a portal to, to dark matter via freeze in production. Um, and uh, we calculated that, uh, it's, it's, it's a standard calculation. And then we see that the abundance of the single fermions relative to the abundance of, of observed dark matter um, depends on the mass of the singlet fermion, on the reheating temperature, and on this coupling constants. And then by suitable choices of the coupling constants, these singlet fermions can constitute all of dark matter in a wide range of masses from 10 keV to 10 to the 8 GeV. Um, and this is very interesting in particular for the right-handed neutrinos because before it was quite difficult to produce them in sufficient numbers for dark matter. So, so yeah, it was surprisingly difficult to produce the right-handed neutrinos, and now with this mechanism, it's uh, it's very easy. Okay, let me summarize the whole talk. Um, so the the motivation was that um, the pure gravity, uh, uh, so in pure gravity, the equivalent formulations of GR, so one and the same theory of general relativity, has these different incarnations uh, like metric. Uh, 
uh, in Einstein Katan. However, they lead to distinct predictions once, once matter is included. So, so, so in, in these uh, predictions that, that depend on the formulation, there's an inherent ambiguity. Um, and that can be quantified by, by the appearance of numerous non-minimal coupling parameters. So whereas there was one non-minimal coupling parameter for the scalar field in the metric case, there are many that are on the same footing as this, this one parameter in the more general formulations. And so I argue that once you buy the one non-minimal coupling parameter, you need to buy all of them. And so this leads to a challenge. So for example, in Higgs inflation, it leads to a loss of uniqueness of predictions, whereas the metric and Palladini scenarios had unique predictions. Now the uh, appearance of the many parameters show that the predictions are not unique. So for example, Higgs inflation does not predict uh, a unique value, value for the tensor to scalar ratio. Um, but of course, this can, can, be, can, can be viewed on the, on the other way. So if we have Higgs inflation and measure the tensor to scalar ratio, that is a very good way to learn about gravity. Um, and then we saw that these non-minimal couplings to, 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 to matter uh, um, have many opportunities. So, so once we have a non-minimal coupling, we can have Higgs inflation, uh, we can the production, have the production of fermionic dark matter. And also an aspect that I did not talk about is um, we can generate, uh, so in a different project we showed that we can generate the Higgs mass from a non-perturbative effect of the standard model coupled to gravity, and that also relies on the different formulations. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention and the many questions so far. Thank you very much for your uh, very nice talk. So uh, is there any question or comment? I have a question on the Einstein Cotton portal dark matter, right? This, you can yep. call this new portal uh, dark matter scenarios. Uh, yep. Is it possible to couple the torsion to gauge field uh, vector dark matter? Um, so I don't see how this is possible. Um, so this is, uh, so because you, you I mean, you, you need to respect the gauge invariance. And then so the, the term you want to couple to is the field strength. Um, and uh, the, just the number of indices is wrong. So, so there, there's no two index object you can form out of torsion or non-metricity. So, so we, we only have the, the one index and the free index. Um, and so, so this is one way of saying it. So I don't see how you can source torsion from that. Um, and this relates to a different discussion. So if you write down the field strength uh, in terms of, of, of the gauge field, um, so it's the anti-symmetric part here, um, then the question is what kind of derivative should you use here? And then, so you can either use the, some covariant derivative or just a partial derivative. And then, um, it turns out you cannot use the covariant one. So in, in metric GR, it doesn't matter. So, so the, the two are just equivalent because uh, the, the symmetry of the Christoffel symbols. Um, but uh, once you include torsion, um, this term would break gauge invariance of, of the gauge field. Um, and so, so once you couple to matter, the only consistent way is to use the partial derivative in the field strength. And, but then it, it yeah, uh, I, I don't see how it how it can can be sourced. So just from the point of view of the non-abelian gauge theories, let's say the torsion is the neutral component, and you could think of other gauge field, and then you can make it. I don't know. In principle, you can write down the like a triple gauge interactions or four point gauge interactions. Uh, so there might be numerous possibilities. It's not single term. That you are writing down, but let's say as you two gauge invariance, uh, let's say the the torsion is the one of the gauge field, and the other two, right? The, the other two real real gauge field. Maybe you can uh, introduce those. So just to, uh, maybe it's not uh, a simple impression, but uh, yeah, one could try to write down. Uh, 
Uh, so you, you're saying that that, that you the, the the torsion as a as a part of of one of the, the other gauge fields, so that yeah yeah if you, you think uh, if it is belong if a torsion belongs to some non abelian gauge field, and I don't know if you put <laughs> two more uh, gauge field. I mean the, just from the range invariance only, and I mean maybe I don't know if you can is is it possible uh to have consistent i mean pretty consistent coupling in gr but uh, just from uh i mean the field theory point of view uh but i haven't thought about that but <laughs> i thought that uh, it might be interesting yeah so i i think i i read some papers also on, on this at some point so of course in this scenario torsion is propagating and uh, then I think people have already thought about that. So not, not yeah, I, I don't know much about that, but I, I think that that is something to be explored. Yeah, yeah. Right, but just, uh, yeah, just because I'm working on non-abelian gauge theory uh, recently, and uh, just uh, the non-abelian part and the, in the gauge connected term, if you expand them, as you just see that there's uh, interactions, uh, self-interactions between gauge field and if you identify one of them by torsion and the other one is dark matter, then, then maybe, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, so did, did you already write a paper about the connection to torsion? So did, did I miss that? No, but uh, I just, <laughs> it occurred to me okay, at this yeah. moment. So we can collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds very interesting. Oh, any other question or comment? Um, may I ask, uh, is it possible to naturally extend model to leptogenesis also? Um, yeah, so the, the, the uh, um, so you could try to, to, to unify and also include leptogenesis, and then you would have uh, three right-handed neutrinos. Um, so, uh and then you have the the so so two have almost the same mass um mm -hmm. so i'm, I'm not ex expert in leptogenesis but it, it seems that only this degenerate masses can give the sufficient like a sufficient amount of, of of leptogenesis and so you have two neutrinos that are responsible for leptogenesis mm -hmm. um and they are also responsible for the the mass difference so the, the ma observed mass differences of the active neutrinos so you so you can choose these these two such that they give both the two two mass differences and leptogenesis and then the third one would be the dark matter that the, mm -hmm. and then here it's, it's very interesting produce to produce that via the einstein cartan portal um, and uh, because then you evade many of the observational constraints. So usually you, uh, the, before you produce the dark matter via mixing of active neutrinos, but then you have the, the X-ray constraints and all things because then they, they can decay to the active neutrinos. And then once you go to the einstein cartan portal, you can make that even really singlet, or you can make the mixing with the active neutrinos as weak as you want. Um, and then that, that would be the scenario. So you have the free right handed neutrinos. One of them mixes very weakly with, with the active neutrinos and gives dark matter, and two others mix more strongly and give the mass differences and, and leptogenesis. I see. Also, is it possible to include uh, like uh, lepton number violated Weinberg operator naturally? Um, so i mean it not not from torsion so it's it's not mm -hmm. that that torsion generates that um so it, it would kind of go out of the philosophy of, of, of what we've been doing so of course you can okay. add it by hand, but mm -hmm. kind of according to to these criteria we would not add it because uh, we only use the higher dimension operators generated by torsion um, okay. but of course this is an assumption and and so so mm -hmm. uh, yeah it uh, i have 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 thought zero about that. So, I mean, in principle, of course, you can write down the theory where you plot both the einstein cartan portal and the Weinberg operator, but I don't know what happens. Thank you very much. Any other question? 
Uh, actually, I have one question uh, regarding on the cutoff scale. So in your model, which interpret the uh, metric and the Palatini, uh, what, what, what is the uh, cutoff scale? Yeah, in the metric case, uh, uh, we know the cutoff scale is given by the Planck divided by no minimal coupling and the uh, Palatini case, Planck divided by square root psi, right? What, what about uh, your model? Yeah, so as you said here, it's in Planck over square root of Xi. For Palatini, it's in Planck over Xi for metric. Um, and then, so in this particular model, we, we, we did study that. And then it interpolates. And so the, the um, it, it's, uh, I, I don't remember the formula. So it's, it's like some formula where you have like Xi eta plus Xi squared or something. So that, that is how you can interpolate. And so it's kind of, there's a region here where you still have the Palatini value. And then there's a transition where the cutoff scale gets lower um, till it reaches the, 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 the metric uh, uh, region. And here it gets even lower. And so it's, it's kind of only the small region in the right corner close to the Palatini where you have the good Palatini behavior. Mm -hmm. So, have you also calculated the uh, most general theory metric of in uh, gravity, the uh, cutoff scale of the metric of in uh, theory? Uh, um, you, you say that you have a certain parameter, right? Certain parameter in the. Well, I mean, we, we, we so, so far, what, what we did was just to write down the theory. So to, to see what kind of terms can I include, uh, solve for torsion non metricity plug back in, see what the kinetic term looks like, and so see what the potential looks like. Um, so the full theory has not even been studied for inflation. So not even tree level inflation. Um, and so it's only specific regions where we, we, we calculated, but, but it seems quite challenging in the full thing. Mm. Uh, I wonder uh, there is a situation like uh, even if one no minimal coupling is large, but you have many another other couplings, so they may compensate, uh, and uh, we may get a uh, relatively high cutoff scale, something like this. Uh, yeah, um, it, it's it's definitely possible. So we don't know of such a case, um, but. Yeah, I mean, if you really have no prior idea about the couplings, yeah, it's 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 many couplings, and so um, it's it's quite hard to make a general statement. Okay, thank you. So, uh, if uh, there is no uh, further question, uh, let's thank uh, speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.